Okay, good morning everybody. Welcome to 971 Sustainability Practices. Uh, my name is Finbar Crispy. I'm a mentor on the team. I've been on the team since 2009 and I help mentor with leadership and organization. And I'm Win Xu. I'm the lead mentor for Team 971 and I've been I've been involved with the team since my oldest son was a freshman in 2004. So we've been around for a little bit. Um, and I, I don't know, I hate cats, so, um, so basically there's nothing magic about what we do on 971, but there's some things that we've learned over the years that I figure, you know, if we can kind of, if you guys can use any of these things that we've learned over the years, um, that, I figure that's a good thing. In 2012, we were kind of struggling with what we wanted our leadership structure to look like, and... Finbar and I actually went around with a list of high-performing teams at championship and talked to them about how they run their, ran their team. And we integrated some of their practices into the way we, we do things. Um, our intention is to present some of the things that we've learned so that maybe you can, if you can use them on your team. So some of the topics that we're going to go through is team organization, team culture, knowledge organization, uh, recruitment, budget, sponsorship, team building, the relationship we have with the school, and define a little bit about defining success on an FRC team. Okay, so team organization. So on our team, we place a strong emphasis on having a student-mentor partnership. The team is structured so that students work side-by-side -side with adult mentors on uh, engineering and other aspects of team, business skills, whatever, and so they can learn real life engineering and life skills by working side by side with our mentors. Students can join in their freshman year. Uh, we don't place any limits on what they can do as long as they pass a safety test and they get trained on all of the tools that they use. They are encouraged and expected to take on responsible tasks. And there are no real minimum expectations for attendance, except for when it comes to attendance and competitions. We do have a, um, a minimum level that we expect in order to get permission to get off school. We also tell students that there's no minimum time requirement to show uh, to be on the team, but if they don't show up a certain amount, we can almost guarantee they'll quit the team because they won't know what to do and won't be involved. Yeah. And as usual, the more you put in, the more you get out. That's what we try to tell people. What, Having more, what, what kind of minimum do you have to for the competition? Um, it's so what we tell students could, is could that. You repeat the question. Please. Oh, what kind of minimum do we have for uh, the students' attendance? Um, what we tell students is that they don't show up to at least two meetings a week, and one of them being one of our longer weekend meetings. Um, we meet four days a week to work on the robot. One's an evening meeting on uh, Wednesday evenings, and then. Uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and if they don't show up to at least one of those weekend meetings, they're they're not going to be engaged in the team. So that's kind of our our, our minimum. Okay. So having more mentors allows us to engage more students. It's not uncommon during the build season to see uh, mentors working with students in groups of one, two, or three, uh, doing software, prototyping, assembly. Um, that sort of thing. We don't have any formal process for mentors to join, um, although this year, we, or last year, we, we did start a process where we asked the mentors to sign a code of conduct uh, before they can uh, be on the team. If you want to formally supervise, you have to be fingerprinted. And the roles can be technical, obviously, software, mechanical design, assembly, electrical, and also non-technical. Uh, we have mentors who help leadership, like myself, um, with uh, awards um, and financial aspects of the team. We also have a lot of students who graduate and come back. Um, this is highly encouraged as it broadens a team of mentors. And those mentors are also now familiar with our culture. Um, making sure that all the mentors have a similar vision for the team is something we're constantly working on. And having these mentors come back makes it a little, a little bit easier to do that. 
And, and sometimes people have trouble with transitioning from being a student to a mentor. But we've been doing this for so many years that there's kind of a, a been a modeling and expectations of what students do once they become college mentors. Right. Um, and on that note, I mean, it's also important that all the mentors agree to abide by the same set of rules and culture that the students are expected to adhere to. Um, if there are differences, it can cause the students to feel like there's a double standard. Um, for example, you know, the older students, particularly the ones who graduate and come back, might feel that they're more experienced on a tool and can take some shortcuts that we wouldn't want the younger students to take, but we try to discourage that because you know, we'd like everybody to be on the same standard. The, the older students obviously are going to serve as role models for the younger students. Um, we have a leadership council, which consists of both uh, students and mentors. Uh, when we started this leadership council, oh, five, six years ago, seven years ago, yeah. um, it was actually an equal number of students and, and, and adults, and now it's a lot more students than adults. Um, we hold meetings every other week during the off-season and um, every week uh, from January through April because that's when there's a lot more activity going on. And it's on a day that we don't meet uh, to work on the robot. So it's, it's just a leadership meeting. Right. The meetings are open to all, um, although typically the, the people who have leadership positions will show up. Um, we have an agenda which is published in advance. There are action items which are noted during the meeting and the notes are taken by a team secretary. And how big is your team? Uh, it, it runs 50 to 60 students. Um, Can you repeat the question? Please? Oh, how big is our team? It runs 50 to 60 students. Um, and how many mentors? How many we, mentors? We probably have, it sounds like a lot, but 25 mentors, and but not all of them show up all the time. Varying stages of activity. Yeah. Some all the time, so. We have student leadership positions. Uh, they change every year, obviously, because the student body is changing every year. Uh, we have a captain, president, secretary, treasurer, we have manufacturing, purchasing. We actually have 22 leadership positions this year. Um, the uh, selection process is that um, uh, at the end of the school year, after all the competitions are over, students will put themselves forward for a variety of positions and we usually like them to tell us why they would be suitable for that position. And then um, the adult leadership discusses the positions, the people who apply, and tries to get a best match between what the students want and the positions that they're doing. And then we also talk to all the students that have applied for positions um, about what position we think would be good for them and get buy-in before we announce a, a slate. Um, and, and sometimes the positions depend on who we have that want to do leadership. So some of the lower, smaller positions will not get filled in a given year because we didn't have enough people that were um, stepping up for leadership positions. But we, we, we look at the, the smaller jobs as opportunities to grow to be leaders for bigger positions. We had one student who was a junior last year who was in charge of bumpers. That was her first, it was her first year on the team. She was in charge of bumpers. She did such an excellent job pulling in people, getting people involved, um, leading, that she's now our assembly lead this year. So now she has a, a senior leadership position. But it was because she showed ex exceptional leadership in a, in a uh, smaller position. So we should point out that everything we're telling you here has been an evolution. When I, when I joined the team, it was much smaller, and you know, trying to get a captain or a president, some of these key positions, you would, you're lucky if there's one person who's suitable, and you try to convince that person to take on the, the, the job for the year. This year, I think for the first time, we had multiple people applying for all of the top positions, and um, you know, we actually had to say no to some people, uh, which was very unusual for us. Um, Yes. Maybe you'll be addressing this, but uh, I think you're touching on the fundamental question is how does a team, we, we're more like you, like you used to be. How do you make the transition? 
How do you, what change, what about the culture happens that causes you to have 60 people rather than 10 and people fighting for leadership rather than being forced to? Okay, so the question was, how, what did we change about the culture to have 55 positions instead of 10 and have people fighting for leadership? I want to fight, fight um, That's a very, very good question. I think part, part of it, go ahead. Oh, I, I, I would say on that, one of the things that happened is we had some younger students who came in as sophomores and said, oh, I'd like to do a leadership position. And what had happened in the past is oftentimes uh, between junior and senior year, the students would suddenly say, oh gosh, I'm going to be a senior. Perhaps I should think about being on the leadership. College jobs. Well, no, it was just that they'd been on the team for years and they, they figured, well, I should give back and do this. But a lot of times they didn't think about it until they were uh, a rising senior. But now since we've had, we gradually got more people for the lower leadership positions, suddenly everybody's thinking, well, gosh, leadership, that's something that we just do. Uh, and so it was, it was a gradual kind of thing. Um, I think the other thing too is that there are, there are a lot more, for the last few years, there are a lot more girls on the team. And I think that immediately sort of multiplies up the number of potential people. I mean, we didn't have that many girls on the team initially. Yeah. And you know, actually, the girls make great leaders, probably better than boys. Well, and, and I also think sometimes what happened, and it's just kind of this domino effect, some of the girls would step up earlier and the guys would go, oh gosh. I could do leadership also, so it, it just it just kind of evolved over time. Um, so, and then another thing that we do because we have open leadership meetings, you know, I figure even if they're not in leadership, first of all, the more people you have in the room when you say, "Can anybody take this task on?" the more people you have that can can take on the task. And the other thing is that. That way, everybody gets. If anybody that's interested can see what we do on leadership, you know. So it's not like this black box that you have to like sign up for leadership. So sometimes they'll come to the leadership meetings and then decide, oh, I could do a leadership position next year. So. So one of the things we did um, uh, a couple of years ago was to write job descriptions for all the different positions we had. Um, we were finding that we had issues, there were gaps in expectation between what uh, we felt the position, the person in the position should do and what the person thought they should do. So writing the job description helps us at the beginning of the year to sit down with a student and go through it and, and basically get a line on what those expectations are. And then during the year, it also helps us to, um, if a task comes up, it helps us pinpoint who should be taking care of it. Um, we used to have so many emails that would go out that would say, who's taking care of this? And now it's a lot easier for us to say, okay, well, that's a president task or that's a captain task, and go to the person and say, well, we need to be taking care of this. Do you want to talk about the project manager? Which? Yeah, that's next. Oh, next. Yeah. So our structure has evolved over the years. Um, as I mentioned, we used to have a single captain. Um, we then um, went to, uh, at that time, the team was smaller. In that case, um, you know, some of the captains would only do uh, technical work and they wouldn't need or manage, and some of, some of them would manage, but then they didn't get to do any technical work. So the team grew, and at one point we had multiple captains, um, where the captains basically divided up responsibilities, but what we found there were, again, things were, were falling in the cracks. So two years ago, we defined the role of the captain as, as a project manager um, who's responsible for sub-team leaders and has the big picture with respect to the robot and then manages the entire design build process. So essentially anything technical. All the non-technical jobs then are handled by the, the president. Um, this is our third year, third year using the structure, yeah. and it's it's working out pretty well. Um, it's um, good for workload distribution. Um, no, sorry, it, it, it is good for workload distribution, but 
especially when we have these uh, sub-team leaders. It will be interesting this year because this is the first time we've had, as, a pro as our team captain, a software person. And the reason that that's going to be interesting is because um, she's going to have to do more managing and less doing because otherwise she's not going to get to do any software um, stuff. So um, we really truly want this to be a project manager rather than um, someone doing, you know, making sure this stuff just gets done. So she's going to have to manage her uh, senior leadership people. So we have a series of sub-team leaders, and they report to the, to the, to the captain. Um, these are assigned by position. They're not by grade. So again, um, anybody in any grade can have these positions. And the status of the robot then is reported basically out to the rest of the team through these sub-team leaders. And then they constitute the senior leadership, kind of senior leadership council, that will get together not to make decisions, but to just say, OK, so what are, we, what are our priorities this weekend? You know, what do we need to get done? One of the challenges that we always have is to differentiate between leading a task and actually doing it. Um, a, a person may be responsible for the task, but that doesn't mean we actually expect them to do it. What we really want them to do is to work with junior members of the team and, and get people in to help do, do the work. As I mentioned, we've got 22 leadership positions this year. Um, and as Wynn said, we try to use the entry level positions to prepare students for larger roles. Um, We're also um, expanding this idea of project manager to our, our presidents, so our non-technical side also, so that we have sub-team leaders on the non-technical side. Um, and Mira, one of our presidents, will be, and Alex will be managing those different sub-teams. We also do not have people have to pick what they're working on or what team they're working on. It's kind of whatever we're working on at the time. So we'll have people that are doing outreach and awards as well as you know manufacturing and CAD and all that sort of stuff. We encourage students to try different things and not kind of get... We don't like to pigeonhole them. Pigeonhole, yeah. yeah. Okay, team culture. So team culture is a very important part of 971. We, we try to be intentional and um, cultivate the culture we want. Because what we found is that you can't change team culture overnight. Um, if you have some sort of culture or behavior that you want to change, um, unfortunately, sometimes, not all the time, sometimes you have to wait till that graduates, that culture graduates from the team. Um, I, I think we've gotten to the point that we have um, developed a team culture. Um, so we don't have to completely change it, but I always encourage people to be very intentional about their team culture. Um, because, like I said, um, it can be hard to change. One of the things we strive to have is a safe and welcoming uh, atmosphere for all the students. And this means, you know, no sarcasm, teasing, swearing, those kind of things. And that sometimes there's a little bit of pushback, but you know, it's really about making everybody feel welcome on the team. Um, we've also found that sometimes even mild sarcasm can be taken, taken wrong by students and can make it uncomfortable for them. Um, another, another thing is, um, you know, people will give somebody a bad time for making a mistake. Well, that's, that's not the kind of behavior we, we want to uh, we want to cultivate. I mean, I actually had a student say that they started like kind of they'd make a mistake and, and somebody would give them a bad time and they'd start making light of it. Oh yeah, well I I didn't you know it's a stupid question, but you know I meant it. I knew it was a stupid question. And we want to really not have we want to have it open for everyone to be able to have their ideas and, and things like that too. So um, we also we also. Um, emphasize respect on the team. So we have no differentiation between freshmen and seniors as far as you know what they can do on the team. They are limited by how much they show up and what their commitment is. And if we ever find any students that are using, older students that are using language kind of 
putting down or whatever freshmen, we, we stop that as soon as we, we hear it. Because to be honest, some of our most dedicated members are freshmen. You know, they come in, they, they learn at a high rate and um, are really excited to work on things. So we want to encourage that. Um, gracious professionalism is, uh, is, a, is a tenet of first that we take seriously. We work on a high level of respect both in the team and outside the team. Question? Uh, what is your recruitment process like? I, I got a slide on that later, so oh, okay. recruitment, we'll cover that in a little bit. Um, so our, our team reputation is important to us, and if we ever hear anything from other teams that uh, people on our team have not been treating them properly, we, we deal with it very seriously because it's, it's very important to us. Um, we also realized that besides being intentional, it needs to be, culture needs to be communicated um, constantly. Um, and it needs to be reinforced and if necessary, revisited. We figured out this past year that, you know, as in every FRC team, all the students go through every four years, so you have a new crop. And if you're not constantly communicating what your team culture is, it can start to start to slip. We figured out this year that everybody wasn't necessarily on the same page as far as culture, what we were trying to um, have happen on the team. And so we decided that we needed to revisit that and have discussions. So um, something that might work for other teams what we did is we had a meeting, and the first thing we did is we had everybody call out what they thought the 971 culture was. And it was a very interesting list of things. Uh, a lot of them were what we were trying, as mentors, were trying to have be on the team. But there were a few that it's like, hmm, that, that's, that's interesting that that's what they think, because that's not really what we're shooting for as a team. Um, and then, um, then we, the next step was we had everybody make a list. We, we had called out what we wanted the team culture to be like. And we're still in the process of working through that. We've been a little busy with moving our lab and new member recruitment and the Spartan series. But we're going to uh, go through those and we're going to pick out, well, first of all, we're going to distill it down to what, what we really want our culture to be. And then we're going to pick a few that we really want to work on this year and, you know, bring it up in meetings and say, you know, are we, leadership meetings, are we, um, are we doing this? Is this what, are we accomplishing these goals um, so that we'll have something to, to measure against? Okay, so uh, knowledge organization, if you could call it that, and communication. <laughs> Uh, we have a website, obviously, it's at frc971.org. It has a lot of information on uh, team organization, training. Um, it has links to our, our team calendar, as well as resources for other teams. Uh, the, our technical documentation, the robot CAD, and the previous year's software. Uh, you can also find a ton of photographs uh, taken by our team photographer, Steve, who is also responsible for the video here. And also the workshops that we've had in the past are all videoed and up there, and then the, the workshops that we're having today are all being videoed, the new ones, so that they'll be up on the website too. We use a Google Drive for stuff that changes more frequently or stuff that's more private to the team, such as meeting notes, purchasing lists, uh, financial reports, um, scouting, strategy, etc. Uh, we encourage all documents to be generated on the Google Drive because uh, it helps transparency and it also helps uh, be available for future reference. Somebody creates something one year, and the next year we say, oh, okay, well, so also did that. Why don't you start with that document and then just modify it? We also um, control uh, access to the drive because we, we have two uh, uh, Google lists that we use that we put people on. One is a general team list, and the other one is a leadership list. And we have anybody on the team list can view all of the Google Drive documents and anyone on the leadership list can edit them. So that way we can take people on and off easily. Yeah, and it goes organized through the email. We also have a, an e-list which is uh, run through the Mountain View High School. Anyone can join it, uh, but it's really just meant for general communication and 
parents, especially parents can be on it if they want to know about upcoming events and things like that. But we don't put any uh, technical robot related information on the e-list. It's all done through the, through the Google list. Um, this is our third season, third year, third year using Slack. Um, still experimenting with how, how it mo it's most effective use, but so far it seems to be working. We have a number of channels. Um, we've tried to make sure that all discussions on design and strategy be held on Slack to make sure there's greater transparency so nobody feels like they're left out. Yes? Do you use Gmail as your primary email service? Do we use Gmail as our primary email server? I would say, yeah, yes. Google list, yes. We so have the, list. all the team members and leadership all Yes, yes. 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 But there are a number of lists. Right, right. So there's a general team list, and then as Wynn said, there's a, there's a list for the leaders. And the e-list, we put all of our meeting times and things on because that's actually, you know, kind of one of the recruiting things because when people come to Mountain View High School, they can go to the e-list and say, oh, robotics team, I might be interested in hearing about, finding out about the robotics team. So they'll sign up and then we just want them to know when to come to meetings. Yes? What did you use before Slack? What did we use before Slack? If anything. The, the genus. Just the genus? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. Okay. And why the switch? Um, it was to be able to, well, we had a mentor one year that thought that it was something that we should do. And um, it actually, it, it makes it for certain things um, so that students can join the groups. And um, it has been, it's been really good for, you know, robot discussion. And um, we use one, um, what's so it called? So robot... more instantaneous than, yeah. uh, than mail. Yeah. It's, and, and it's a lot more spontaneous. You get a lot more discussion. Like, yeah. It's like a chat. And then also, one thing that we really use it <coughs> for is um, the robot status. So we try to get to varying degrees of success, get students to post pictures about, you know, prototyping and things so that if a student isn't there, they can look on Slack and see what happened. Um, we found in the past there was a lot of times, I don't know, I guess it's out of sight, out of mind, you know, they wouldn't show up for a few meetings. It's like, well, I guess nothing happened while I wasn't there. Well, you know, this is to try to show everybody that things are happening and that we put, you know, pictures and all sorts of stuff on there. So, so um, we found over the last few years that we, we have to have a policy on social media. Uh, there's a plethora of, of social media sites out there. And these days, everybody is posting. Um, we basically have found that we need to have a policy that where you can be identified as being on 971. You need to make sure that whatever you're saying is, is, is cleared with the leadership because you're representing the team. And it's very, very important that what you are putting on social media represents the culture of our team. Um, and well, and I, 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 it's actually more of a discussion than policy because um, I think a lot of times people don't re don't think about the fact that everybody's reading the social media posts and things. So, do you have a question? No. Okay, recruiting. Okay, so um, in some ways we're always recruiting for the team because we always, you know, people are talking about robotics and we tell, you know people we know and people will tell uh, families that are coming into the school that they know um, that about their experience on the robotics team and stuff. Um, some of the ways, specific ways we, we recruit is we put out fly and then we just have people can come and find out about the team and um, we've also gone more to instead of having people give us their emails, we make a slip and hand it out so that they have to be interested enough to sign up for the email lists. Um, we also meet all year long. Um, we meet on Wednesday nights all year long. And so as soon as a middle schooler is done with middle school, they can start coming to meetings during the summer. This, this summer was pretty <coughs> tough because uh, our rooms were like stacked this high with boxes for a month or two. but. But we did all right. Um, we also have, there's back to school night, which is when all the parents come. And so we put a robot out um, and hand out 
information there to the parents. And then Club Arena is something they have in the fall during lunch where all the school clubs, you know, put out and get people to sign up for their, their club. So we'll take a robot out and, again, hand out the little slips of paper. I had one person that, that signed up their email address three times, had a demo and then two things, and none of the email addresses worked. So that's why I decided that they need to take the initiative and do the sign up themselves. Um, as far as integrating new students, it's, it's always, it's kind of challenging because we don't have like a start date. We have people showing up from the beginning of summer to sometimes the beginning of build season. Um, so we kind of have a rolling, a rolling orientation. Um, we'll have, uh, as new people come in, we'll have more experienced students showing, uh, showing them the lab and how everything works and, and things like that. And then we do, um, uh, and then I've started in the last year, I realized that since we don't start on a certain, everybody on a certain date, um, I have what I call the talk. So we have a, um, one of the things to join the team is a uh, safety waiver, which basically says, we want you and your parents to understand that we use power tools and safety is important and all this kind of stuff. And so they have to hand that in signed by them and their parents. And so before that one gets my signature on it, I give them a talk about you know basic rules and things that we want everybody to know, team culture, um, you know, who to talk to and all those kind of things. Because I realized there was no time that we actually had them all in the room to talk to them. So that was my solution for that thing. Um, our formal training is we have tool training. So they all go through basic safety tool training. We also have a safety test that they have to take. And then we're, we've been trying to work on some, some additional formal training, but a lot of what we've had um, currently like I said, the, the moving was a little tough, um, is to show up and ask questions. Because we'll have two students, both new students will show up at the team. One will show up a lot, ask lots of questions, and within a month is like running machinery and doing all sorts of things. And the other one sitting in the other room looking at their, their phone because they don't know what to do. The only difference is one of them showed up and asked questions and was willing to work on whatever was going on at the time so um, yeah and then you know we have them work alongside other students and mentors that's one thing about having a lot of mentors is that um, you know they'll work on a project and show the new students how to do things we're, we're hoping to add some more training on beyond safety on best practices and things but we're working on on uh, developing that curriculum and stuff too so Mentor recruitment. So as far as mentor recruitment, if you try to make the team be a, a welcoming and, and fun place for the mentors to be. Um, because we're a partnership, they're working with the students and um, it, it's just a difference in our culture. Some, some teams, the mentors are more hands off. Um, but we tell them the same thing, the new mentor, if they haven't been through FRC, the same thing that um, we tell the students that they just need to show up and ask questions and they'll figure out how they can fit into the team. Okay, I guess we've got 15 minutes left. We should probably go through yes. this relatively okay. quickly. Um, we have a budget which we set every year. Uh, it's broken down into a number of categories such as robot tools, outreach. Um, we also have a, a, a scholarship that, that we use fund for, for students who can't afford to, to travel so much. Uh, the obvious reason for doing this is so that we can keep track of what we're spending, but it also helps teach the students the basics of budgeting and financial reporting, uh, having a balance sheet and uh, cash flow. Yes? Um, so this is so on uh, uh, recruitment, but do you mm -hmm. have a certain standard for, um, for like letting people into robotics? So Is there okay. a standard for letting them in onto the team? Yeah. Yeah. So, so far, we haven't had to make any cuts. On the team, um, it's anybody that comes can join the team, and if we get to the point that we start getting really big and we have to think about cuts, um, I want to keep the bar fairly low because often some of our best 
team members show up with a meet, at a, to a meeting with a friend and they didn't know they wanted to do robotics. So the likelihood of them applying, the likelihood of them coming if there's a really high bar to join would be lower um, or the likelihood would be lower. So I kind of think if we did have to go to uh, where we have to limit membership, I would lean more toward like second years. If you don't show up and contribute the first year, you have to apply to come back um, because you just never know who those high performing students are going to be. Um, so, and, yeah. and how do you find mentors? How do you find your mentors? How do we um, find mentors? It's usually through friends of, of existing mentors, typically. Yeah, and you know, like I said, we have a lot of alumni that come back. So they'll come back and work with students on CAD during breaks and help with prototyping at the beginning of the, you know, before they go back to school at the beginning of the season. Um, and then we had one person who's joining this year who, who had two daughters at the school that didn't want to do robotics, so now the youngest one has graduated and now he, get, he wants to come and help with robotics. So um, I think part of it is, is making it so that they feel welcome and that it's a good use of their time. Um, so Have you had any experience with special needs kids on the team? Um, we, have a, a, we have a little bit. Uh, this is talking about special needs kids on the team. We have had a little bit and it is because we're not a formal class, it's a little bit more difficult. Um, but we do try to, you know, because we have a lot of mentors and people working with them, it's, it's possible. We also have the engineering class. Um, there are, uh, the engineering class actually works with our special needs um, classes to like develop things that they need to have done and things like that. So, so thank you for all the questions, it's really good, but we are under a little time stretch, so if you wouldn't mind holding the rest until the end of your time, or you can always catch us afterwards. Yeah. Maybe happy to and then we, did, we have a 15 minute passing period, so we don't necessarily need to get out of here right at right. quarter after, so but let's at least get our thing done. done. Um, as I mentioned, we have an accounting system, it's run on Google Sheets. Um, if you're interested in knowing more about this, we have an exciting talk at 1.30. <laughs> about about so you come back and come back and come back for that. Sponsorship? Um, so people ask me how we get sponsors. We have a lot of sponsors and there's, you know, I don't know that there's any magic formula that I could say every sponsor came here to us in a different way. Um, some of them were fairly serendipitous. I'm not sure you could reproduce them, but I have a few things that as far as um, finding sponsors and maintaining sponsors. So I, we try to be a quality team and this doesn't necessarily mean winning but being showing sponsors that you're making an impact in student lives. Um, I send out regular updates to our sponsors and I try to include a lot of pictures and not just oh well how did we do at a competition but this is what the students were doing and this is what they learned and this is the impact that they're making. Um, always be promoting the team because you never know where that next sponsor is going to come from. You know, whether it's a parent. We've had ones that somebody was sitting next to a board at a, someone at a board meeting where we gave a presentation and said, "Oh, my neighbor should sponsor a robot." You know, they had a company, and that was Intuitive Surgical. So we were their first. We were their first team. But so, how do you reproduce that? You know, it's basically always be promoting uh, first robotics, um, and then. Our other thing is like no, we never lose sponsors. Um, we constantly send out updates. We communicate with them. We tell them we appreciate them. And so we've had some sponsors that we've had for eight years or more. So. Um, okay. So team building, and we've talked a lot about culture, but um, you know one of the things we do encourage is, is inclusiveness uh, to foster the feeling of being part of a of a family. Uh, we hold uh, potlucks throughout the year. These are a regular part of our culture. Um, we started having them so that parents and families could get to know each other and see what, they're, what the kids are doing. Um, and now we have them several times a year. We always have one on kickoff day so the parents can come and see the game and uh, see what the team is going to be spending their time on for the next. And it also days. helps for getting 
parents to volunteer because they have a better, a more of a connection with the team and they need other parents on the, on the team. A few years ago, uh, Wynne and her husband Michael started having a mentor potluck at their home during the summer. It was started off as a way to thank the mentors, um, but now it's also uh, a way to transition in the graduated seniors into being a mentor. And we also have started sometimes inviting mentors from other teams because yeah. we appreciate them too. Right. So, um, and then we have an alumni potluck uh, just before Christmas where we invite uh, uh, students who are at college to come back and tell us a little bit about what they're doing, what they've been working on. Yeah, and they'll make up a couple slides and show it to the other students. Sometimes they're making the slides as they're sitting at the potluck, but it, it, it's all good. Uh, and this isn't me when I was younger, this is my son. <laughs> <laughs> so school relationship, we developed, we cultivate a good relationship with our school. Um, we, we do not receive funding from them, but we've been um, fortunate, and I, I know from talking to other teams that we're very fortunate that they let us do whatever we need to do on the team. Um, we actually, I, I say that they only provide space. Um, for us, but we are actually getting a permanent location in this current remodel, so that we're gonna, it, that will be very nice. Well, it's not going to be huge, but we're going to be sharing machine shop with the engineering class, and so it will be uh, a better situation. Um, I send the same updates that I send to the sponsors to any school staff that will and, and uh, district um, people that I have their emails for, and teachers and the. the counseling staff so that they can also know what we're up to. Um, we also show, I try to use, give respect for all of the staff, including the janitorial services and the people that take care of our rooms and the facilities. And, and to be honest, they'll do anything for us. I mean, we need <laughs> the floor wax today. They'll, they come in and they do it for us. So it's, it's been a huge thing. We've also, um, because we, we respect the staff and the rooms that we use, um, like like the classrooms that for this they, they they give us keys and say go ahead use the classrooms and that we need to you need to use so um, the teachers have been really good and the, the uh, uh, administrative staff. Okay. All right, last slide. Um, so what is success? Um, it's it's not about having a robot that wins every competition. Uh, for us, the goal is to build a sustainable team that provides an, enrich an enriching experience for students and mentors and grows to be a world-class team and has a lot of fun doing this. We're constantly trying to improve, both technically and organizationally. Uh, sometimes it's a challenge, but we do try to evolve every year. It's not a one-year process. Some goals take many years to achieve. So I encourage you to ask yourself, what, what is your team mission? What are your goals? How are you planning to achieve them? And remember that measuring yourself against realistic and well thought out goals and working hard to achieve them, uh, by doing that, success will come at you. Yeah. And actually this year we're also revisiting our team mission statement, trying to you know, talk about, okay, what is it that we want to be our team mission statement, kind of call it down to something that we can you know, print on the wall and point to that for what we want our team culture to be like. So. Okay, so if there's a couple of questions, we can, yeah, go ahead. Is that your mission statement, that, that, that goal? That is a current mission statement. Yeah, but we are working to, we have some new mentors that, that said that we need a, a, a more succinct, pithy mission <laughs> statement, so we're working on that, so. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Does the school charge you for space? Does the school nope. charge us for space? No, they do not. No, they do not. They're very, um, you know, so we have kind of a, I guess, a laissez-faire relationship with the, the school that they, they like what we're doing and they're extremely supportive and they don't charge us for space so, um, and things like that. So we know that, that we're all volunteers. Yeah. There are no, there's no pay Yeah, staff. we don't have a paid coach or, or yeah. anything, but we do realize that we are very fortunate in some of those aspects. So you, um, does your team have to have some kind of insurance or anything to get full access to the facilities without having anyone 
as a district employee? So do we need insurance to get access to facilities? Uh, the answer is no, we do not. But uh, we are a school club, school club. so I guess well, technically we are, we are required to have a supervisor, a fingerprinted yeah. adult, in every room that a student is working in. So it gets a little harder. It has gotten a little harder over the years. We now have two rooms. We have a lab. We've got a, a classroom. We also have access to the engineering room uh, where there's a mill. So everywhere where there's a student working at any time, there needs to be a fingerprinted adult. So supervision has, has gotten to be uh, actually quite a challenge for us. But no uh, district employee? No, for a while there they wanted a district employee, so I was actually a district employee. Mm -hmm. And the PTSA uh, donated some money and, and the, the list of jobs in California, state of California, you could find us. We were at the very bottom of the list because I think we got $200 or a piece or something like that, but we were employees. But not anymore. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Hi, I'm Sarah, and I'm a mentor on FRC Team 971. We hope you enjoyed this video. For more videos and resources, please subscribe and visit our website, frc971.org.